Amen. Amen. Um, I'm grateful for an opportunity to, to preach tonight, and I trust that uh, it'll be a blessing to you. It's always a challenge to teach or preach here because um, knowing many of you all, I know that you do know the Scriptures, and I'm very grateful that it's always a help as a Christian man to be a part of a local church that values the Word of God and loves it and reads it, and we talk about it and we apply things and we figure out where we're not doing well and where we are doing well. And so I hope that encourages you. I'm grateful to be a part of you and to see uh, the Word of God dwell in you all richly. And that's my prayer that it, that will continue to take place in our church, in our local church, that we'll continue to know this book well and to practice it all of our days. Uh, tonight I'm there in John 15. So keep your place there. I have a couple other scriptures that I'd like to reference, but I'm going to have you stay there in John 14 and 15. The title of my sermon is this, An Illustration of Growth. An Illustration of Growth. Behind me we got a banner here in the baptistry, and it has one word in it, grow. Now for you grammar nuts out there, what part of speech, out of the eight in the English language, what part of speech is the word behind me? Any takers? Good job, Brother Larry. It is a verb. Now if it was a noun, I know I've already lost half of you, you're like, come on, I graduated already. If it was a noun, it would be growth, right? You get it. Grow. The reason I point out the grammar is that the word behind me is an action, right? It's a command. So tonight, if you would, focus in John 15. I'd like to draw your attention to two verses in particular. So look there with me. First of all, at verse 4, this is Jesus speaking. He said this, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. Now look at verse 7, please. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Now that I've pointed out verses 4 and 7 to you, first of all, I'd like to, to draw our attention to this, that Jesus in John 15, which by the way, if there's a season in your Christian life in which you're going through maybe some dark times, some difficult days, maybe there's some extra burdens of that season, of those weeks, those months, I encourage you, turn to John 14 and 15 and read it several times and let the truths of those two chapters really fill your heart. It'll be like a balm. It'll be like a medicine. I can guarantee that. But here in John 15, Jesus uses this illustration of husbandry, of the vine. Now I have to admit to you, I'm not a gardener. Do we got any gardeners here tonight? Don't be ashamed. Brother Hadley? Okay. Green thumb? Could we say that? A little bit? I know we have some other green thumbs here. I, I call myself a vicarious gardener, okay? My wife will garden. Several of my children will work in the garden. Usually I'm just the structures guy, okay? Where does the fence need to go? What do we need to trench? How much dirt do we need to move? Do we need to bring in mulch? What do we need to rip out? So I can't say that I have a green thumb. Maybe i got a black thumb because I'm always changing stuff or ripping things out. Um, I did a little bit of um, lawn maintenance as a young man. Maybe many of you have done that. You know, it's good hard work, get decent pay. Um, I also had a chance to cut some trees for a couple years as I was paying for college. That was hard, honest work. It paid well. I thank God for the men that I worked with. They had an extremely good and solid biblical work ethic. So being around trees and gardening teaches you some things. In fact, the older I get, the more I'm grateful for a lot of the illustrations in the Bible of animal, the animal kingdom, animal life, farming, being a rancher, we might say, and gardening. In John 15, Jesus, as the master illustrator, is connecting with the people listening to him because he said, you know, just like a vine has a source, so is your Christian life. I'm the source. I'm the vine. You're the branch. The branch cannot operate in and of itself. It is impossible. All of you gardeners, you hear, you know what I'm talking about. 
You got to have the, the base plant, the root, the trunk. In fact, if you want to get technical, I think the life-giving part of the vine or of a tree, if I could use those as an illustration, is that thin layer they call the cambium. It's in between the bark and the heartwood or the center, which is not alive. That's fibrous, right? And then the bark is the protective outer layer. And there's this thin layer in between those two that draws all the nutrients and the water and carries it up the trunk and to all the branches and then therefore to the leaves, et cetera, that do the photosynthesis process. Maybe I'm ringing the bell with some teachers here. I don't know. <laughs> Jesus wants his listeners to understand, hey, Christian, you must abide in me if you would see fruit in your life. And I would like to go ahead and apply that and say, you know, the fruit of a Christian is another Christian. So that's why we obey the Great Commission. That's why we see that he that winneth souls is wise because that's what we're designed to do is produce other Christians. Obviously, it's the truth that does that, but God has chosen us to be the bearers of that, that truth so that others can hear the gospel and believe and be saved and know that they're on their way to heaven. Jesus said you need to abide in me to be able to do that. So an illustration of growth. Jesus says, I am the true vine in verse 1, and my Father is the husbandman. Verse 5, he said again, I am the vine, ye are the branches. And then that's when he gave us in verse 7, I'll draw your attention to it once again, he gave us a conditional and he said, if ye abide in me, now catch the next phrase, because I want to transition, I want to pivot here, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Verse 8, herein is my Father glorified. And is that not the goal of our life, is that God would be glorified through us? Jesus says, this is the way, this is how it's done, abide in me. And then in verse 7, the second half, he said, and my words abide in you. So allow me to present this to you. This month is kind of like a focus on scriptural growth. And if you're like me, there's always room to grow in your Bible reading, your Bible understanding, your Bible knowledge. Um, if you didn't get the handout from Sunday school last week, Brother Ross categorized and compiled and some excellent points on just digging in and saying, okay, I know how to read my Bible. Is there a better way I can study my Bible and maybe cover some more ground? There's plenty of methods. Get one that works for you. Stick to it, and you'll see what God will do. Abide in the vine. So first of all tonight, i got just three thoughts for you. I want to answer the question of what. What's, what's the going on here in chapter 15? And it's a command. Just like the word behind me here, Jesus gave us the command, verse 4, He said, abide in me. Notice it was a suggestion, right? I mean, He could have given us a principle here, but He didn't do that. He says it's, it's critical, it's necessary, it's how it works. You need to rest in me. You need to draw your source of strength and of understanding from me. Now make the connection with, with me, if you will, church family. John 1.1, 1, 1, some basic doctrine here that we all know. Jesus and the Word are the same, correct? We know that there's no discrepancy, there's no misunderstandings between the Word of God and the living Word, Jesus Christ Himself. Now He's not with us. The Comforter has come. But nevertheless, we know that Jesus is truth, the Word of God is truth, the Scriptures He left with us. So, He said in verse 7, If ye abide in Me, and My words abide in you. Consider what Peter said in 2 Peter 3.18, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Ross was covering that really strongly last week, saying, you know, it's about studying and knowing what the book says. And that's hard work. What is it that we're looking at in John 15? The command of growth by Jesus, verse 4. The command of growth. Let me give you a second thought tonight, if I may. So, underneath this thought of an illustration of growth for the Christian, abiding in the vine, abiding in Christ as a believer, first of all, we've got to understand that it's a command. It's what God expects of us. Can I be uh, pretty transparent with you and say there's days where I don't fulfill that command? 
Sometimes I'm on a call, I'm working on a machine, and I don't know about you, do you ever have machines in your home that don't work as they, they're supposed to or they're intended? Or do all your equipment works perfectly fine, right? You have no issues, no problems, right? Absolutely not. We have a lot of technology, but chances are you'll go through a day or several days where it's just a fight with that machine. Well, that's me every day, right? As a mechanic, you're always fighting machines and trying to persuade them to operate as they should. And sometimes it doesn't go that well. Some days it does. So the command of growth, there's days where I don't cooperate with the Holy Spirit and Him prompting me and trying to guide me as, his, as a child of God, as a, as a Christian man, to abide in the vine. To let Christ's words dwell in me richly for what purpose that I might preach to others, that I might give it out. If I go out on a call, I'm constantly rubbing shoulders with people that I know have never heard the gospel or they have the wrong gospel or they would be open to believing the gospel if I would stop and set aside my schedule, my plans and my agenda and say, okay, Holy Spirit, I'll do what you're prompting me to do. I'll abide in the vine. I'll trust the Lord to remind me of the scriptures so that I might bear fruit. God wants to do that through each and every one of us here each and every week. Now, maybe it's like today. Don't let me discourage you. We knocked doors for quite a while. A couple of us went out. It was a tough plow. Sow a few seeds. One gentleman was clearly saved, knew he was saved, didn't back down on it. At least that was his testimony. We could rejoice in that. But we didn't necessarily get anyone to stop and say, okay, I'm interested. Tell me more. Often we get those opportunities, don't we? But many times we don't. Nevertheless, we're still sowing seed, right? We're still speaking the truth. Sometimes that seed's already in the heart. There are folks out there, they do get a sense that the Bible is God's Word. They were raised underneath maybe some good teaching or preaching, and there are truths that are in their heart. Maybe they're just away from the Lord. Maybe the gospel was never presented to them fully or clearly. So they might believe that Jesus is God. They might have grown up in church, but then you come along and you're equipped and ready to bear more fruit. You're abiding in the vine. You're trying to allow Christ's words to dwell in you richly. And so you begin, what? To water the seeds that have already been put in their heart. The truths that they've already been taught. You come along. You come to their door. You show them some compassion, a smile, some concern, some love. Kind of like Christ, right? Bold. Jesus was bold. He didn't give any slack for false doctrine. He was hard on the Pharisees, was he not? But man, he was compassionate on sinners. And he was clear. And there you come, you knock the door and you water. Maybe you're getting groceries. Maybe you're on your routines. Maybe you're with a customer. And the conversation switches to some more personal matters. And you can stop and say, hey, you know what? The Bible has an answer for that. Church member, I challenge you to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Don't forget about the command to abide in the vine. Christ wants to bear fruit through you, through you. Let me give you a second thought. I'd like to answer the question of how. How do we do that? And I've kind of titled this the capacitor of growth. The first one was the command of growth. We're commanded to grow, right? If we're abiding in the vine, we're going to grow. We're going to bear more fruit. I don't know what your goals were last year. I don't know what your goals are this year. But I imagine the Holy Spirit's been prompting you and giving you the goals that He has specifically for you as an individual Christian, and you know what they are. Maybe you got them jotted down on the flyleaf of your Bible. Maybe you got them in a, a calendar somewhere. I don't know. Whatever your method, I know that that's the way He works because I know He's always tugging at my heart. And His Word, does it not teach us that? That God has plans for you? He says plans of welfare, like in the Minor Prophets, right? Not of evil but of good. So the second thought today is the capacitor of growth. I got a little illustration here. Y'all bear with me, okay? I'm an HVAC guy. And I want to I be clear. I'm not trying to diminish the majesty of God. Um, I just want to use a simple illustration because it's from my perspective as a technician. So um, how many of you here have ever had a HVAC technician come out to your residence and replace a capacitor 
on a machine. Don't be, don't be shy. I know this stuff, these things go bad all the time. Makes me wonder if they engineer them to go five years and fail, 10 years and fail. Y'all know what I'm getting at here. Okay, this is a capacitor. I won't bore you with tech, but the bottom line is without this little guy right here, your air condition will not work. It is impossible. Unless you got someone out there on a bike with a belt tied to it and they're pedaling, okay? <laughs> that motor is not gonna run because in the residential world, here's the catch. The motors in your air condition run on what we call single phase electricity. Now the commercial world, they get a break because they get what we call three phase electricity in most applications. This church facility has three phase, thankfully. But at your home you have single phase, so basically physically to make that motor rotate, which moves the hot air from inside your home, I'll just, you know, oversimplify here and say let's get the hot air from the inside and let's eject it outside where we don't care, right? So we stay cool in our homes. Got to have this guy for that motor to run. The Bible's pretty clear that we need the Holy Spirit to do the work of the Lord. And this morning, Pastor mentioned the indwelling. He taught us, he reminded us of the indwelling, a doctrine that is all very dear to us and that we're aware of, that wherever we go, the Holy Spirit is there with us. He walks with us. He goes with us. Jesus said when he left, the Comforter will come. We sing the hymn, do we not? The Comforter will come, the Holy Spirit given, the song goes. And he's here with you. And he always is, and he always will be. So John 14, if you look back over in your scriptures there, just one chapter back, it may even be on the same page. It was read this morning, verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. Okay, so if I jump back over to John 15, Jesus said, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. In John 14, he said, Even the Spirit of truth. Truth and the words of Christ, the Bible, the Scriptures. So God, the Spirit inside of you, with the Word of God in your mind and your heart, now we have a great combination. So the second thought is, how do we grow? How do we bear fruit? Well, who's the capacitor of growth? Who's enabling us to do it? It's the Holy Spirit inside, prompting us, teaching us, reminding us. In fact, let me uh, just cover it this way. If you read down in John 14, jump down a few more verses. Verse 26, here's what the Bible says. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, so this is God Himself, God the Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And while we're thinking about the Holy Spirit, jump with me to the end of chapter 15 in John. The Bible says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, there it is again, same statement by Jesus, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And Jesus is the Word. So here's my thought. Bear with me, okay? Follow this logic. In verse 26 of John 14, there's three things specifically in that verse that we know the Holy Spirit does. Number one, it's in His name. He comforts us. Amen? On your difficult days, when the enemy tries to send discouragement your way, the Comforter is there with you to remind you of the promises of God. Let me give you an illustration of my wife when she was a 12-year-old girl. John 5, 24. One of her favorite verses. I'm just going to go ahead and flip over there and read it to you. John 5, 24 says this. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is Jesus speaking, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. What a promise. What a great verse to teach eternal security that when someone understands they're a sinner, they realize Jesus is the only way, that his death, burial, and resurrection, their belief in that will save them and give them the gift of eternal life that they have just that, eternal life. That they have heaven. Can't lose it. John 5, 24 would teach that doctrine. That's a great comfort to the believer. That we have everlasting life. It's a done deal. So he comforts us. Hey, I don't know where you need comfort this week or today. I don't know all your struggles. But the Holy Spirit does. Amen. He knows every one. 
If the Scriptures would indicate that God both thought of us before we were formed, then formed us, then brought us into this world, that when we're saved, He'll walk with us throughout this life, be with us in death, and then fulfill His promise to give us eternal life like He said He would, to be with Him forever, then wouldn't it make sense that He knows all the burdens you have right now? That He's not aloof? We heard some preaching recently on the sparrow. But if he knows, what a sparrow falls. What does the song say? I know he watches me. So Christian, let the Holy Spirit comfort you tonight, tomorrow, this week. Because he will. That's one of his jobs. There's a second thing that he does. He teaches us. He is the teacher. So as Baptists, this is a big doctrine for us. In fact, the older I get, the more I think I cherish this doctrine. You know, we don't believe in Christian hierarchy. We believe in the offices. Because those are clearly taught in the Scriptures. You know, we have a pastor. We have an order to our service. Why? Because we see those patterns in the Scripture, and we want to honor the patterns in the Scripture. We want to obey the Scriptures in regard to ecclesiology, ecclesiology to our church life, the way we do worship. But the Bible teaches us that we all are individually accountable to the book and to go to the Lord in prayer. We need to do that. We must do that. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. He teaches us what this book is saying. Do you realize you don't have to have a commentary written by a man to understand this book? That's so right. yes. You can learn some basic definitions. You can appreciate, and I know I'm echoing what other men have just preached here in the last few weeks, but it's so true. Let's just shatter that glass and let's get that out of the way. You can sit down with your Bible for 10 or 15 minutes Read a chapter, half a chapter. I had a Bible teacher in high school who's a humble guy. He came out of just athletics, but God stirred him up. He began to walk with the Lord. He began to study the Bible. He ended up getting a job teaching Bible. A humble man, but he loved the Bible. He trusted it. And he would just take four verses a day. And he's very open about that. He's like, that's about all I can handle. I take four verses and I dwell on those four verses for 24 hours. He'll look up definitions. He'll think about it. He'll try to compare those with other scriptures he's read revolutionized his life. Kind of one of my heroes is a man, has ten children, still serving the Lord today. Appreciate his influence in my life. It was because of the influence of the Bible on his. It was because he was Holy Spirit taught. He had faith that he could open his Bible and God the Spirit who lived inside of him would teach him the words of God, that they would abide in him. Here's a third thing the Holy Spirit does. He reminds us. He brings to our remembrance. Remember verse 26? and bring all things, the last part of the verse, to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So Jesus said, the things I've taught you, disciples, what you've heard me teach you, when I'm gone, the Holy Spirit's going to remind you of them. So we don't have Christ in the flesh with us. He's with the Father. We have the Word of God with us so we can expect the Holy Spirit to remind us of the things in this book. Stick with me. Here's my question now. Holy Spirit comforts. He wants to teach us. And he wants us to remind us of what has already been written down. How will the Holy Spirit do those three things if we don't read God's book? We can't. And I'm preaching to myself. So the more we read the book, the opposite is true. The more He can comfort us, the more He can teach us, the more He will remind us of what He's already taught us. And so those words begin to abide in us. We learn how to abide in Christ as a branch, abiding in the vine. Why? So God can bear much fruit in us. You're at a door. And that person has questions. And you've already been abiding in the vine. The Holy Spirit has already been comforting you. He's already been teaching you. And then this individual asks you a question. And what does the Holy Spirit do? He reminds you. He brings to your recollection the scriptures that you've already read or memorized or been, been discussing with other fellow Christians at church or in the way, as it was often in the, in the um, Gospels, right? They would talk in the way, as the Bible says. So we answered the first question, the command of growth. What, so what's important in John 15? The command of growth by Christ, to abide in the vine and to bear much fruit. Peter reminded us to grow in grace and in 
the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we looked at the capacitor. Who? It's God the Spirit that brings this about. How does He do it? He comforts us. He teaches us. He reminds us. And we agree. In order for Him to do that, we have to invest ourselves in reading the Bible. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know, Chad, I'm just not a great, I'm not a great reader. That's okay. Switch to audio. Are you a good listener? Download it, right? Stick it in your ear. You're working on something, just let it be played for you. That's a great way to grow. Maybe you are a good reader. Maybe you know audio's not your thing. You're, you, know, you like to focus, and so when you sit down to read, you have really good retention. Hey, then up your reading hour. Double down. Hey, what's your goals for the second half of the year? I'm starting to really think about those. I'm, I'm behind in the game on this. Just being real transparent. I, I want to go further in my Bible reading for 2023. I'm not where I need to be. I want His words to abide in me. I believe that's the heartbeat of the people here tonight. Amen? Let me give you a third thought. Our time will be gone. So I answered the what, the how. Consider this. What about the why? What about the why? And I'd like to call this the collection of growth. Why do we abide in the vine? Why does God want us to grow scripturally this year? Because there's benefits. There's a collection. How many of you here got something you collect? Okay, nobody. Never mind. Forget that. No, of course. All right. All right. I'm not, I'm not going to pick on hobbies, okay? I'm just saying as human beings, isn't it interesting that we naturally collect things, okay? So here, I tell you what. I'll rat myself out, okay? I'll, my kids are probably going to shake their head on this. I, got, I don't have a lot of things I collect. Um, we got a big family, so collecting things tends to stack stuff up. And we don't want to do that, right? You all know what I'm talking about. You know, you end up, why, why is all that in there? I need to clean that out. I shouldn't have collected that to begin with. Anyways, as human beings, we often collect things or things that interest us. Um, maybe you're a book collector. You really enjoy books. Do you always find yourself looking for another bookshelf? Because it's like, oh, I got it. Well, should I get rid of that? Do I want to get No, that's, you know, that was from so and so. Oh, that was a real, right? You appreciate those books, so you collect them. That's a good thing to collect. Maybe some of you collect cars. Hope that doesn't go too far, but maybe you've got some cars your dad or an uncle gave you, and you got a car or two in the garage because they got some inherent value. I don't know what you collect, but I do know this. When we abide in the vine, when we rest in Christ and He begins to bear fruit in us, John 15 teaches us that there's going to be some results from that. You're going to end up collecting some things as a Christian. Let's look at what those are and our time will be gone. Focus with me, Will, in John 15 again. Look down at verse 9 and 10, if you will. Jesus speaking, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. So Jesus gives us another command there, just like He said to abide. He says, continue, continue what? In my love. As the Father loved me, so have I loved you. Look at verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. And then doesn't the Scripture also teach us that those on the outside that are not believing yet will look at the Christians if they are abiding in the vine and they're bearing fruit. So they're preaching the Gospel. The fruit of the Spirit also is being worked in them from the Holy Spirit. And those that are unbelieving will look out and they will know that we're different by the love that we have for one another and for God. Law of Liberty Baptist Church, I want you to know that that's one reason why I look forward to coming here on Sunday mornings. I want you to know this. I enjoy what I talk about with you all. I enjoy the investment that many of you all have made in my children. I enjoy laboring with you as we do it for the Lord. And I hope we have many more days and many more years of that, that we would see others' lives change and affected because we continue to labor in love together. I don't know who or is a ploy of the enemy, I would think, to somehow or another diminish the love of God. And as if men or as, as people, we should think that, you know, that's just the emotional. Side. No, love is of God. And love is something we ought to emulate and preach and teach to the next generation. They already know it anyway. They sense whether we love them or not. People at a door, they have kind of an antenna for that, right? It's a stranger. You just met him. Or maybe it's someone you rub shoulders with at work, an acquaintance. They sense whether you love them or not, whether you have compassion on them. 
It's the way we're wired. We're made in God's image. Let Christ's love dwell in you richly. Let it come out. You know, you'll collect love as you abide in the vine. It'll start to build up inside of you. You'll start to have more compassion on souls. Next thing you know, you realize, man, i got to get back to work, and I end up talking about, you know, salvation or the scriptures or something with this guy because he was just open. He wanted to talk. He had questions. Your heart will begin to fill up with love. That'll be one of the things you collect if you abide in the vine. If you allow growth in your life like Jesus wanted from the disciples that he was teaching here. Here's another thing you might collect. What about joy? That's a great thing to collect, isn't it? It's something to stock up on. Look with me, if you will, in verse 11. The Bible says, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. So he's, he's saying, you know, I don't just want my joy to remain in you. I want you to be full. I want it to well up inside of you. And maybe we could say it kind of spills over. And don't misunderstand me. I understand we all have difficult days. This body works against us. The back, the feet, the neck. You know, maybe you don't have the energy you used to have. I get all that. Um, I was sharing with some of, the, the, um, some of my sisters in Christ back here during in-between services. You know, my mom has a habit of sharing with people that even though she's in her, in her um, late 60s, she will turn 70, I believe, her next birthday. She says, you know, Chad, I, I still feel like I'm 27, like my spirit. She's like, your spirit doesn't age. My body keeps working against me harder and harder. She's like, but I feel the same. I'm the same person. And you know, that has a truth to it. Her name, incidentally, is Joy. My daughter's middle name, my oldest daughter's, is Aletheia Joy. And that's where that comes from. Joy is from the Lord. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Jesus said He wanted your joy to be full. Despite the difficulties, despite the pain, which is there and is very real, Evidently, we can have joy. We can start to collect joy as we grow by abiding in the vine. One more thought here. My time will be gone. This one's a little more difficult, but I think it's very important, particularly for what we see in the days ahead. And we shouldn't be afraid of it. And that is, you may collect some times of persecution. Do you have some memories right now? Maybe your mind's run into some difficult days where you were trying to do what's right. You were striving to be a better Christian and a trial was brought in or the enemy began to attack, whatever the context is, and you were actually persecuted or depending on how you define that word, I understand most of us don't suffer physically for our faith, but you might be ridiculed or mocked or despised. Hey, we had a couple of doors slammed on us today, literally just not interested, bam, seems to be growing shouldn't deter us from doing what is right. It shouldn't deter us from abiding in the vine and continuing to seek the Lord as He bears fruit in us. You might collect some persecution along the way. Look with me, if you will, in John 15, one last time, verse 18 and 19. Here's what the Scriptures say. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. I have a burden. Let me communicate this to you, if I may. I wonder what the days might be like for my kiddos. And I wonder if, as a dad, I'm doing a good job or not of preparing them for potential persecution that they might collect along the way in their Christian walk. Because obviously if they're abiding in the vine, filling their minds full of the Scriptures, they're studying the Scriptures, especially as we look at, you know, end times and see how many things in our world are playing out in such a way that it's reminding us of the things that Christ said and what John wrote in the Revelation. As our kids begin to learn of these things, and as parents, as we teach them, I often wonder, Lord, am I doing a good job of preparing them for persecution that the Lord might choose for them in the days ahead? I think that that is a worthy goal. I think that's something we should think about as parents. Hey, how can I better equip the next generation to be prepared for the world 
to hate them more than the world even hates those of us who love this book today and who are endeavoring to obey it. We can't always guarantee easy times. Grace for a space, I've often heard several preachers and teachers say about our country, America. We've been afforded a lot. We've been given great religious liberty. But the winds of change are coming, are they not? We see changes already. We see the difference between what we know we have as religious liberty versus what, say, our grandparents had on hand or enjoyed in their lifetime. And I know it goes up and down. I'm not trying to be a guy who's predicting the future. I'm just simply saying persecution will always come and we need to be ready for it. It might be something you collect along the way as you abide in the vine, as the Lord seeks to bring or bear fruit in you. The title was An Illustration of Growth. Jesus wants to grow you and me more this year. And we looked at some ways that he's going to do that. First of all, we need to acknowledge that it's a command. It's not like an option. Jesus said, hey, abide in me. That's the only way it's possible. But then he gave us the comforter, right? Who will do just that. Comfort and teach and remind. And then along the way, as we yield to the Holy Spirit, and as we abide in the Word, and as we study and get to know it more and more and more, so it's just simply a part of our thinking, then we're going to collect some things along the way. Hopefully our heart will be full of love, we're going to have joy, but we'll also need to be ready and willing to go through persecution if God chooses so. An illustration of growth. I want to do one more thing before my time's gone. Him, maybe you've sang it many times. There's a peace in my heart that the world never gave, a peace it cannot take away. Though the trials of life may surround like a cloud, I have a peace that has come there to stay. Constantly abiding, Jesus is mine. One more thing. Brother Doug, Verse of Scripture right now, any context, any book that comes to mind that you know by heart, it'd be almost impossible for you to forget it. You'd have to have in just a verse that you can think of, sir. The heavens declare the glory of God and the uh, firmament shows the same work. Amen. Brother Larry, what's a verse of Scripture that just, it's there? Any verse. Sir, Pastor, a verse. Wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Ms. Sylvia, a verse that comes to mind, ma'am. Are you comfortable? Yes. Yeah. Um, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2 8 9, right? Amen. Brother Ross, Scripture. Church family, I remember one time as a college guy, we had a godly leader. He was a good man. So I end with this. His heart and mind was full of the Bible. I really appreciate him. He was a good, good influence on me. And when he would get us floor leaders together, we had some responsibilities, just men, maybe about 10 of us, and him included. He would start doing this. And there were some good men in that group, young men that really loved the Bible. We had a lot of extra time, so we're reading it and memorizing it. And sometimes we would go 10, 15, 20, 25, half an hour, just going round and round, just repeating the Word of God to one another. The nights that I left that group were amazing because my mind was just full of the Bible from listening to those men quote, God's Word over and over again from the Old Testament, the New Testament. And then as they quote a verse, then you begin to think about that story and that context. And what was happening is we were doing that once a week. So the Word of God began to dwell in us richly. And that's just what we talked about all the time. That's one of the things that can happen in a local church. So that when we go out, whether you go out on a Sunday or a Saturday or whether it's at work, whenever your time is and you're trying to bear fruit, 
The Bible says that we'll be filled with the Spirit. We'll be able to, He'll bring to our memory all these scriptures and we'll bear much fruit. I challenge you with that for the rest of the year. I hope this was an encouragement to you tonight. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord Jesus, I thank you for um, all that you taught here in John 14 and 15. Help us to remember it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.